The main objective is um, to explain uh, what is a bi-level optimization problem, to understand the, the issues in modeling and in solving those problems, and what are the interesting applications. Results uh, are that um, this is a very powerful tool for modeling real life situations. Um, and the main issue uh, is uh, how to solve them. And uh, in fact, uh, the main message is that this is a domain full of fake news. <laughs> Most of you know who she is. Uh, she is Sandra Lorenzo at the University of Brussels. Uh, she is very famous in the relational research. She has a lot of papers in international journals, more than 120, a lot. She belongs to the editorial board of uh, important journals. And two important things uh, for me is that she was the president of Euro in 2007 and 2008. And Euro is the association of the Operational Research Society. So it's a very big association and to be the president of such a society is very important. It was not so far, it was 2007 and 2008. But this year, she has received the Euro Gold Medal, which is the, this year, sorry, this is the current uh, winner of the prize. And not only this, this is an important prize uh, for additional research. But she is the first woman receiving this prize. But it's also yes. important for me. <laughs> I, I want everybody, but I especially like <laughs> women reach very important things. And the prize is from 1987. And being the first woman is not. So the main fields of interest, interest combinatorial optimization, um, location routing, transportation optimization, um, bi-level programming, uh, in general, um, combinatorial optimization, doing bi-level, doing transportation, doing location, it doesn't matter. A lot of uh, topics appear in the several papers it has. And for me, it's an honor and a pleasure that she's here today. Um, I give her the, the word. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mercedes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's not my first visit in Elche, but it's, I think it's my first visit in the University of Elche. Well, the University of uh, Hernandez. So, uh, I really appreciate being here. I have a very nice week. <laughs> we are working hard. And uh, so I've been asked to give a talk. And uh, this talk will be about bi-level optimization. This is something I'm working on for 30 years now, maybe. Um, and uh, this is something that uh, optimizers are not so much familiar with. So I will give uh, a talk that is uh, not very technical and I think also it's good because in the audience there are a lot of students so I want to give you more intuition than to give you very complicated uh, results. So um, what is uh, the agenda? So I will explain you what is bi-level optimization and then I will concentrate on the linear case, uh, so when uh, we have linear constraint and linear objectives. And um, I will give you examples, so I try to, to explain you what, what are the difficulties, what are the issues. And uh, already in the modeling, there are some interesting things to, to discuss. And then I will talk a bit about bilinear <laughs> objectives and linear constraints. I'm not sure I will go to the last item. It depends on the time. I don't want to talk too long. Uh, I prefer to answer questions or have a free discussion. So, so let's see what, what I do. So I may skip the last part. We'll see. 
if I talk too much about the, the beginning, then <laughs> we'll skip. So what is uh, my level optimization and uh, let's see the linear case. So by level optimization, first, now if you look at the first two lines here, this is a very general description of an optimization problem. Huh? You optimize, you maximize an objective function and you have some constraints saying that the solution here I represent by x and y uh, must belong to some set. So this is very general. Now x and y may be vectors. Each one is a vector of several coordinates. And in fact the specificity in a bi-level optimization problem is that the vector y is itself the optimal solution of another optimization problem. So you have a nesting of two optimization problems in each other. You see? And so this guy here, he has his own objective, which may be completely different than this one. And so this one is going to decide on x, the vector x, but he knows that the second guy, after, will see this solution x and will react, will choose a vector y that maximize this objective function that is the objective function of what we call the second level. So you have, this is why we call it by level optimization. You have two levels. You have the first level and then the second level. Okay? There is a, a hierarchy here. You see, the, f the, the first level decides something first, then the second level reacts, but the first level knows exactly what we, how the second level is going to react. It's maybe a complicated problem, this one, but he knows the problem. The first level knows the problem of the second level. So he's going to take this into account in order to make his best decision regarding the vector x. Okay? And in fact, this, this kind of uh, concept is in optimization is rather recent. The first paper that talks about bi-level optimization was published in 1973 in the journal Operation Research by two guys, Bracken and McGill, and they consider uh, a military application and they provide some properties of the problem and so on. So this was the first paper. So you see this is uh, 50 years ago more or less. It's not that old with respect to optimization. But also you may think oh in fact this is a bit older because this existed already in economy and there is a a famous economist called Heinrich von Stackelberg. This was uh, the beginning of the 20th century. This man was a mathematician, an economist. He studied both. And uh, I think he was born in Russia somewhere, then studied in Germany. Uh, he got a position in Germany. Here, there's something I can say. He was a Nazi, in fact. and. Uh, after, uh, during the Second World War, he moved to Spain. He changed his mind, fortunately, somehow. And uh, he became professor in Madrid at the Complutense. And he died in 1946, so at 41 years old. And uh, this, uh, this uh, economist, um, published uh, uh, a book, I think, if I remember well, in which he described uh, a context of competition between two companies. Uh, and uh, this is why, and this is uh, sequential, this is why there is a leader and a follower, and in fact the leader corresponds to a first level in a bi-level optimization and the follower to the second level, and these are two, comp two companies competing. 
And the first, they, they compete in, in quantity, so they decide which quantity they will offer on the market. And uh, if they, they offer too large quantity, the price decrease, and so they lose money somehow because they, sell, they must sell the, the quantity at a price that is too lower, you see? And uh, so first the leader decides about the quantity he's going to offer and then the follower reacts by <coughs> giving his quantity and then the game is over. <coughs> and so this is also why people sometimes call the first level the leader and the second the follower. Trace back to uh, uh, Enrich von Stackelberg. So now one may wonder well, why to look at this problem, this kind of problem. Uh, uh, why is it interesting? Well, uh, the first is, as I gave you this, this, uh, this example uh, of competition between two companies. Um, this is what is usually what called economic game theory. You have companies who compete, they may compete in quantity, deciding which quantity they are going to offer, or they may compete in price. And then you have customer who decides which, uh, to which company they buy. Usually they buy to the, the company that offer the lowest price and so on. And you may think, okay, maybe you know, you have heard about John Nash and the Nash Equilibrium. I don't know if, if the student uh, have uh, ever heard about this. John Nash was uh, an economist and he, he received the Nobel Prize. He died a few years ago. And uh, he introduced a very important concept which is different than the Stackelberg solution. Uh, John Nash proposed what we call the Nash Equilibrium. So these are also in game theory, so you have uh, two, uh, two competitors, let's say, and uh, they must take decision or strategy. And a Nash equilibrium is a pair of strategy in such a way that when they are, the two competitors choose those strategy, no one has an interest in choosing another strategy. That means that the strategy of a player is optimal when the other is choosing the equilibrium strategy as well. So it's considered as a stable solution because when they are at the Nash equilibrium, no one has an interest to move. And often this is the type of solution that is repetitive, that happens when a game is, is repeated and repeated and repeated because if I choose a solution, you decide to, to react with the best solution and then I react again, again, again until it becomes stable because nobody has an interest in choosing something different. And this is a Nash equilibrium, you see? Here it's different. If you think about this, uh, this idea of Stackelberg, there is really the notion of sequentiality because the leader take a, takes a decision, then the follower reacts and the game is over, you see? So this is... Uh, an, an, a, they are uh, totally informed from the decision of e each other, but the game is over the, uh, after the second level is played. Okay, yes, um, but except uh, besides the economic game theory, there are many other applications. <coughs> and uh, I will uh, show you some, uh, some applications. Uh, I have been working on some of them. Uh, in production planning, for instance, sometimes you may have a company that decides uh, how much it is going to, to produce, for instance, a production plan, but then uh, it may have uh, to subcontract for the delivery. And um, maybe the price of the delivery, the, 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 the company doing the delivery is doing this or asking a price in order to optimize its own objective function. And so you have this bi-level aspect that, that arises. Uh, revenue management is, is also something very typical and I've been working quite a lot on this. So revenue <coughs> management is the field of, uh, you want to determine the price of goods 
usually perish perishable goods, for instance, a flight ticket. This is something that is perishable because a ticket for tomorrow is good for tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow it's lost. You cannot do anything with it anymore. Okay? And in this, this field of revenue man management, you want to determine optimal prices. For instance, for flight ticket. What is optimal price? It's a price for the company that is going to maximize its revenue. Because if you ask a price that is too high, people are not going to buy your flight ticket. Uh, if, uh, uh, for instance, if suddenly Ryanair is going to ask a very high price, uh, you decide maybe to fly Vueling or Iberia. But if Ryanair is cheap enough, you say, okay, well, uh, I will buy this one because uh, I'm a student, I don't want to, pay, to spend too much money, and I'm going to buy the Ryanair flight. You see? And this is revenue management. In fact, I have been working with, with colleagues from Montreal, among others, on revenue management, and uh, so to determine price for train tickets, for instance, and we had the uh, a startup company uh, who developed a software for de uh, determining the price of train tickets and for instance Renfe was our customer. You see we made the, the pricing of the AVE. Uh, also uh, we have been working a lot and if, if I have time we will talk a bit about that uh, on determining the optimal value for toll for highways. Because again, if you ask a very high toll, people decide not to go on the highway. They take the, the free road that is maybe longer, but that you can afford. You prefer to pay less and take a little bit more time. So you make an arbitrage between the time, the travel time, and the price you're going to, to pay. So what should be the optimal price for each segment of the highway in order to maximize your revenue? This is one thing. You can think also about different type of objectives. You say, okay, I want to put toll on the highway. My goal is not to maximize my revenue. My goal is to minimize congestion. And you can see this. For instance, there are some, uh, some places where the price you pay depends on the time of the day. Early morning or late afternoon, you pay more because they try to have less people on the highway so that it, it's more fluid. So you may have different objectives and you see this is also a bi-level optimization problem because the first level the company decides on the price with some objective, minimize congestion or maximize revenue and then in the second level you have all the possible users who decide what they do. They buy the product or they use the highway or they don't, or they use something from the competitor. And the company knows perfectly what is the objective of the followers, but they are different followers and it's difficult to, to take into consideration the uh, behavior of all of them to maximize your own revenue. Okay? Now, insecurity also, this is a very interesting topic I've been working on. Uh, if you think about uh, all those uh, terrorism issues we have nowadays, uh, well, you had these uh, problems in Madrid at the train station years ago, in Brussels we had problems at the airport, there was some shooting, uh, in Paris they had terrible things as well. Uh, now, what is, how can you think about using bi-level optimization in this case? Well. In a town, the police consider that there are several places that can be attacked. You call them targets. Hmm? But maybe you have only 20 patrols, police patrols, and you have 50 potential targets. <coughs> so what do we do? You cannot secure everything every day. You may decide, oh, I will secure the most important ones. 
But those bad guys, the terrorists, they can analyze a bit the behavior of the police and see that every day there is a patrol on this target and these are the target there's never a patrol. So they simply can attack the place where there's nothing. Aha. So what to do? There is one trick that is to use what we call mixed strategy. I don't know if you are familiar with game theory. So a pure strategy, for instance, if you have 10 patrols and 50 targets, a pure strategy is a subset of 10 targets that you are going to secure. Now, a mixed strategy is to decide the probability with which you are choosing each pure strategy. So for each subset of 10 targets, you define the probability. And the sum of the probability of all the pure strategy should be equal to 1. So it's a probability distribution on the pure strategies. Okay? And then every morning, there is a dispatcher that draws at random, according to this probability distribution, the strategy that will be implemented. So which targets will be secured on that day. And so it changes every day. And even if the bad guy can observe the behavior of the police, it can determine this probability distribution. It does, the, the bad guy does not know on the day he wants to act, attack which targets will be secured. So he's done. And this is the best way, and this is, people have been working on that, I've been working on that as well, on determ to determine the mixed strategy, the optimal mixed strategy, so the optimal probability distribution on the pure strategy in order to maximize the, the chances to, to catch the bad guy because you think, well, if there is a target that is attacked by the bad guys but there is a patrol, the problem is solved, the, the, the police will catch them and that's it. Okay? <coughs> this is application for terrorism, but also for uh, controlling borders, for to catch smugglers or the illegal uh, people going uh, to a country without, uh, so without the visa and so on. Uh, you cannot control every truck, so this is the kind of uh, strategy they can use. Um, also, the, uh, I prefer this kind of application, in, uh, it's to uh, protect uh, endangered animals. So maybe you remember some years ago there was a, a lion that was shooted by a dentist. I don't know if you remember this, in, a, in a, um, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Africa, in some, um, some natural reserve, uh, and this, is, uh, this guy was uh, simply uh, doing this for, for his pleasure, and, but there are also uh, people who are hunting elephants for, for the, the defense and so on, and uh, again, uh, you cannot put a guard behind every tree in the natural reserve. This is not possible. So again, they need to implement those randomized strategy to prevent from, uh, from uh, those, the, to, to, to catch those bad guys who try to, to uh, uh, catch the, those, those species who are endangered. So this is a good application. I like it. It's better. Okay, so you see there are many, many different applications. Now, I want to talk about, to give you some uh, intuition about why this is a difficult problem and uh, what are the difficulties in those problems. So I will start with a linear by level optimization problem. So now I put some equation a little bit. So you see here, uh, I have a problem in which in the first level, I decide upon the value x on the vector x, let's say you can assume that x is a vector. Huh? Um, and so this is the objective of the first level. 
uh, it involves the first level variable and the second level variables, then you may have some constraints here. And in the constraints, in fact, I specify that the vector y is the optimal solution of this second level problem, which is also linear. You see, everything is linear here. Uh, A2, B2, A1, ah, there should be no A here. There's a mistake, I'm sorry. Uh, so these are, these are matrices uh, of constant, and D2, C1, D1 are vectors, okay, of constants. So this is, if, if you would have this, this would be simply a linear problem, a huh? linear optimization problem then, that you know. And uh, also here, um, you could add a term C2 times X, but given that the second level does not control the vector X, this would appear as a constant. So there's no need to put it, you can forget to remove this term. Okay? So now let's see a little bit of geometry. And so I show you here a very small example in which I have one variable X for the first level and one variable Y for the second level. Okay? And uh, here I have no constraints in the first level. So my second level is this, and you see here, in fact, I can forget this G1X because X is controlled by the first level, so this appears as a constant for the second level. So in fact, the second level is maximizing G to Y under those constraints. And imagine that this is given by the following polytope. So it's a, here a bounded polyhedron, so I have only linear constraints here. Okay? This is clear? Now, each time that, imagine that the first level choose a value y here, and assume that g2 is positive. So that means that the second level is trying to find a value for y, such that the solution remains within this box, but in such a way that y is as big as possible. Okay? So if x is here, the best response for the second level would be y under this red segment. It's just here. Okay? Now, these are all the possible values for x because it must also remain within the feasible region. And so that means that the best response for all possible x gives me a pair of segments here, which is the, the above part of the polyhedron, and this is what we call the inducible region. It's the set of points X feasible for the first level with the corresponding best response Y. Okay? And in fact, now the first level is looking for a point here for which this function is as big as possible. Now imagine that the objective function of the, second of the first level increase in this direction, uh, so f is negative or something. Well, then that means that this would be my optimal solution of the problem. <coughs> okay? It's clear? You see, this is the inducible region and you look for the point that has the smallest value for s in this pair of segments. So you go down, down, down as much as you, are, but you must remain within the, the red region. So this is the lowest point and this is the optimal solution. Now, in fact, you can interpret the inducible region as somehow the feasible region of the first level. Hmm? Because you have the uh, uh, choice, a feasible choice for the first level plus the best response of the second level. And the first thing that you see here is that this is not convex. This is a bad news. And also uh, it is uh, nonlinear, it is uh, piecewise linear. 
buff. So one way interesting that would be for solving this problem would be to try to find the convex cell of those points and then to solve the problem as a linear programming problem. But this is hopeless. As we will see, in fact, linear, by level linear uh, optimization is NP hard. So finding this convex cell in general is, is hopeless. Okay, now there are some additional difficulties. And this is important from a modeling point of view. I will write a few things on the board after. Now I choose more or less the same example, but here you see the difference is that I add some constraint in the first level. And in my example, I assume Y is again this, this, uh, this little house, but XY belongs to X, means that the point XY must be below this horizontal dotted line. Okay? Now there is something strange here. In the sense that this guy here, the second level, is not informed about that. He does not see that. He's only is in, in his, his world is this, this box here. Huh? So if I, I give you a point X here, this guy, by, if he wants to maximize his objective function, is going to choose the point here. And this point is not feasible for the first level. So it's not a feasible solution for the whole problem. That means that all the value here of x such that the best response y does not satisfy this constraint, all those point x are not feasible in my bi-level optimization problem. So now I have uh, an inducible region which is made of those two segments here and it is not connected. So this is a bizarre thing, it's a uh, set of segments here because I'm in two dimension but they are not connected. Bizarre. Okay, so also you have to be very careful about when you do the modeling you see when you put the constraint you have to think well is is the second level aware of this of this constraint does he know that because then you should put the constraint below here or if he's not aware then you put them there and it may me imply that some decision for the first level are not feasible you see so it really depends on the situation you, you want to model. Now, this, there is something that we call the high point relaxation, which is given by the set of constraints of the first level and the second level. So here, this is this green area. And if you maximize the objective function of the first level on the feasible region of the high point relaxation, you obtain a relaxation of the problem. So here, given that this is a maximization problem, it means that you obtain an upper bound. Because in fact, if you look at the, the set of points satisfying those constraints plus those ones and you maximize the objective function, you don't take into account that it should also be the best response. So it's a relaxation, you see? And this is used usually to obtain an upper bound. <coughs> okay. Now, uh, yes, I come back to those coupling constraints. You may have some, also some strange situation. Um, for instance, now imagine that uh, the, the constraint that is in the first level um, specify that the point must be below this dotted line here. Okay? Well, in fact, now in this case, 
the bi-level optimization problem is not feasible. Because whatever the value of the variable x you choose in the first level, the optimal response of the second level will be above this line. So there is no feasible point. Okay? And here is completely different. Now I do <coughs> something different. I put those constraints in the second level. So now I consider this is the feasible domain of the second level and when I maximize g to y well any point here in fact is optimal okay any uh, the, the inducible region would be given by the whole segment here because for every x the best response would be a point on this dotted line and now if the objective function if uh, of the first level increase in this direction this would be the optimal solution so you see it is very very different you have really to to be careful and to understand what you what is the real situation to model and uh, if you consider uh, papers that have been published regarding bi-level optimization it's interesting to remark that there were several times mistakes that were published. People were saying, oh, you can move the constraint from the, first, uh, the second level to the first level. This is wrong. You see it like this. You see? Um, and so there's a lot of fake news, as we say, in my level optimization. This is rather interesting. Now, maybe <coughs> I will do some parentheses here. Uh, to give you also some, some interesting uh, view regarding uh, the modeling. So, I consider the following problem. I'm given a graph. I have a set of vertices and a set of arcs. It's a directed uh, uh, graph. And I have a source and a sink, an origin and a destination. Now, the first level wants to interdict k arcs and the second level choose a shortest path from S to T without using the interdicted arcs. So for instance Imagine that uh, I can interdict, mm. yes, I can interdict two arcs, okay? If I interdict those two arcs, and of course each arc has a certain cost. Huh? Five, one, two, three, four, one, seven. Then if the first level interdict those two arcs, then the second level is going to choose the shortest path in the graph in which I have deleted those two arcs. Okay? And the, the goal for this guy is to maximize the shortest path length. And this one, of course, is to minimize. Okay? So how can I model this? There are two ways. I will tell you because otherwise <laughs> it will take too much time. But the first idea is to say that each arc for an arc ij, I have given the cost cij. And if I interdict the arc, then the, the cost of the arc will be something very big, okay? 
And so here I will put some variable that I will call xig, because x is a first level decision. Okay? So if the arc is not interdicted, the cost is this. If the arc is interdicted, the cost is that. Okay? So <coughs> now the problem is what? In the first level, the guy is maximizing sum over all ig in R of. Okay, I have constraints saying that the sum of the yij must be smaller than or equal to, what did I say, k. Okay, and then the second level minimize now the same objective such that, well, yij is the shortest path. So here I should say that the, can I say simply that yij is the shortest path? You know how to model this, huh? yij corresponding to a path, is a path, from s to t. Okay? Uh, here also I have, of course, that yij as zero one. Okay? Of course, M must be big enough. But if, if you take M bigger than the largest cost plus one or something like this, you sure that if I interdict, oh, sorry, this should be an X here. Yes, that's it. Um, if, if the arc is interdicted, if xij is equal to 1, this cost should be so big that you're never going to use this arc in the path. Okay? So it's a valid formulation. But now you can think about another way. You can say, okay, I'm going to maximize ij cij yij sum of the xij must be smaller than or equal to k this is fine and then here in the second level I minimize this so yj is a path from S to T and Xij plus Yij must be smaller than or equal to 1 for all Ij in A. Because here if I interdict the arc if this is 1, I cannot use this arc for the path. Okay? So, this is equivalent, though the two models are valid, if the number of arcs you can interdict is not too big. Here, for instance, if I want to inter I can interdict two arcs. What would you do? I would interdict those two. This is a minimum cut. If the number of arcs you can in interdict is smaller than, is bigger than the number of arcs in the minimum cut, you're going to cut this and you see from this model that the cost of the path will be 
very big in the sense that they will be one arg with a big M involved in your path. But here is completely different. Because if I do this here, imagine that I choose a solution x that interdict those two arcs. That means that for this solution of the first level, I have no solution of the second level. It's not feasible. So the interdiction of those two arcs is not a feasible solution for you by level model here. It's not true. You see? So what you're going to do in this case is that this model will, would give you a pair of arc to interdict in such a way that there is still a feasible path from S to T, but that is as big as possible. So the interpretation is completely different. You see? And then you can imagine also a third possibility, which is what happens if I move this here in the first level? Then you end up with something very bizarre or, or stupid maybe because your second level is this only. It does not depend on the first level anymore. It's simply a shortest path. You all, the second level is always choosing the same solution, the shortest path. And your decision of the first level has absolutely no influence. Okay? So you have to be very careful. You see what, what you, you do when you model a problem because you, you end up with very strange or different situation that may make sense or make no sense. Okay, now let's see. So. <coughs> Um, mirror display. Yes. Very good. Uh, so we have seen that already. Now I told you that by level optimization is a difficult problem in general. And to see that, in fact, you can remark that when you have a zero one programming problem. So you have a problem with zero one variable which is known to be NP hard. Huh? For instance a linear problem uh, you want simply to uh, for instance to maximize Cx such that Ax is smaller than or equal to B but X belongs to zero one each, each <coughs> variable must take a value 0 or 1. This is a problem that is known to be NP hard. Huh? And you can model it as a linear problem. That what I mean is that this constraint, or in particular a variable xj belongs to 0, 1, you can model it as a second level problem in the following way. You see, <coughs> what do I do? I say, OK, I will have a constraint saying that this is a constraint of the first level, v, some variable v is equal to 0. And then my second level is the following. I want to maximize w such that w is smaller than or equal to x, smaller than or equal to 1 minus x, and bigger than or equal to zero. If you look at this, what is it? Here I represent in two dimensions. I have x here and w here. So w smaller than or equal to x is uh, this one, right? Yes. w smaller than or equal to 1 minus x is this. Okay? W bigger than or equal to zero is this. So my feasible region here is this triangle. And if I maximize W over this triangle, what do I get is this. 
So this is my inducible region here. But given that in the first level, I have that V is the optimal W, must be equal to zero. In fact, I have only two feasible points, which are x is equal to zero and x is equal to one. So each constraint like this, I can write it as a, sing a small second level for that variable x. And so I have several second levels, one for each variable. But that means that by level optimization is NP hard because it's a special case of this one. Okay? <coughs> okay, now, now we know that this is a difficult problem. We know that there are some issues regarding modeling. Uh, nevertheless, we would like to solve those problems. So how can we solve them? In fact, maybe you remember your class of linear programming. You may remember that there is a beautiful property for linear programming that is the strong duality. Hmm? And what does the strong duality say? That there is when you have a linear problem like this, this is a lin if you look at the second level, huh, you, this, for the second level, this is considered as a constant because x comes from the first level, it's given. So in fact, maximize d to y under the constraint that b to y must be smaller than or equal to b to minus a to y. It's a linear problem. And you know that there is, an sol uh, you can write the dual of that problem, and you know that there exists, an if, if the, the, f <coughs> the, the primal is uh, feasible and finite, there is always an optimal solution for the primal and the dual, such that the value of their respective objective function are equal. Or you have what we call the complementarity constraint, slackness constraint. You remember this? And this is what is written here. You see, we can use this property to model the problem as a single level optimization problem. So the idea is that I'm going to remove this second level optimization problem because I don't know what to do with this. And I do it the following way. You see, these are the first level constraint and the second level constraint. I keep them here. Okay. Now, my because my second level problem was uh, oops, maximize d two y such that I have b2 y must be smaller than or equal to b2 minus a2 x. So this is my second level now. Hmm? And so to write the dual, I will define some, a vector of dual variable associated to those constraints. And you see now here I have the constraint of the dual, because the constraint of the dual would be lambda times b2 must be bigger than or equal to, must be equal to d2, okay? And then I have lambda must be bigger than or equal to zero because this is an equality set. So these are the constraints of the dual And these are the complementarity constraints. The complementarity constraints, what do they say? They say that the dual variables times the difference between the left and the right hand side must be equal to zero. And this is what I have here. Exactly, you see, lambda times b2y minus b2 plus a2x must be equal to zero. 
And the other group of complementarity constraints would be y times uh, blah, 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 lambda 2 b2 minus d2 must be equal to 0. But this is automatically satisfied because I have an equality here. So here I have only one group of complementarity constraints. So this is now, I, I, in this way, I obtain a model that is in which I say explicitly, you see, that y is an optimal solution of the second level by saying, oh, I have dual variables such that they satisfy the complementarity constraints. You see? So in this way, I reformulate my problem as a single level optimization problem. But it's a difficult one. Why is it a difficult one? Because here you have products now variable. It's not linear anymore. Because I multiply dual variable by primal ones. And this is the difficulty. Okay? Now, how to continue? Because you want to exploit this to nevertheless be able to solve the problem. And because we are combinatorial or mixed integer optimizers, we think, oh, oh I have here a product of two expressions. And given that this must be equal to zero, I will introduce some zero one variable to specify this. And this is, was done for the first time by Fortuny, Amat, and McCall in 1991. <coughs> and they do it in the following way. You see, I introduce a variable z. Uh, uh, imagine that I have only one lambda here. So I have, this is just one constraint, OK? So what I say, I introduce this z here, which is a 0, 1 variable. So if z is equal to 0, this implies that lambda must be smaller than or equal to 0. Lambda is 0, so this is satisfied. And what happens when z is equal to 0 here, this constraint becomes inactive. Because I choose a, what I, we call a big M here, a value M sufficiently large such that this is always satisfied. OK? Now, if on the contrary, z is equal to 1, now this big M is such that every feasible lambda is smaller than this big M. So this becomes inactive. But given that z is equal to 1, now I have this constraint. And given that I have this one, you see this is the reverse. It implies that a2x plus b2y must be equal to b2. So this is equal to 0. So I model the fact that the product is equal to 0 by using one variable. Now, if I have several constraints here, of course, I need one z variable for each such constraint. OK? This is nice in the sense that you think, oh, very good. No, I have a model that is linear. It is a mixed integer linear problem. So once I have determined those values md, I put d for dual and p for primal. Huh? Once I have determined those values, I give this to cplex, and I'm done. Ah, yes, but no. <laughs> this would be too easy, because in fact, what happens is that, OK, it's not, I cannot tell you why the difficulty is yet. First, what we, I go a little bit further with the properties. Um, here, given that I uh, use complementarity slackness and strong duality here, in fact, what I know is that in, in, for a bi-level optimization problem, the solution x and the solution y of the second level 
they must determine, there must be vertices of the polyhedron of the primal and the dual, respectively. Because we know if you solve a linear problem, you know that an optimal solution is a vertex. So x must be a vertex of the first level, or the, the high point relaxation. And y must also be a vertex. Okay? So there is an optimal solution, which is a vertex of the high point relaxation. But now this high point, will, and we also know that the big M, there, is, there exists some finite value for the big M. But how can you find that? That's the, the trick. Because very often what happens is that you have your primal problem of the second level and then you look at this dual of the second level. And very often the dual is unbounded. That means that the polyhedron, you know that the optimal solution will be a vertex of this polyhedron, but this polyhedron is unbounded. So how can you, you need to find a big M that is an upper bound on the coordinates of the vertices of this polyhedron. So you have a eraser. No. Anyway, imagine that this is your second level problem. No, oh, it's okay. Ah, fantastic. Thank you. So it may be that. Imagine that this is, you are here in the lambda space, in the dual, huh? lambda space. And you know that you are only interested in those vertices because by strong duality, you know that the only interesting candidate will be the lambda data vertices of this polyhedron. But you don't know that. And there may be an exponential number of vertices, you cannot enumerate them. Huh? And uh, if you want to find a bond, so you need a bond on, on, on each coordinate, this big M. And in fact, what we have proved is that it is NP hard to find the big M. So to build your model, if you do not know anything specific, more specific for the problem you want to solve, Finding a big M, so obtaining a, a valid model, is an, it's, it's an NP hard uh, task. It's very, very funny, I find. Because, again, about the fake news, this, uh, this guy Pineda and Morales, by the way, they are from Malaga. So you see, it's close from here. Uh, first, they, they noticed that there is a common way, well, historically, the way people used to do it was the following. You see, if you look at this formulation, huh, people were choosing some value for the big M, solving the problem, giving to cplex. And if one of the constraints with the big M was binding at the optimal value, they would double the value of the big M and iterate. And until they find a solution, uh, some big M and a corresponding solution, such that none of those binding, or none of those constraints with the big M was binding. And they were stopping. They were saying, now we are done, it's, it's optimal. And they proved, they, they showed a, a very small example in which by doing this, you end up with a solution that is not optimal. So they found some big M, such that the optimal solution, uh, the constraint with the big M are not binding at the optimal solution, but this is not the optimal solution. And so we worked on this because we wanted to, to solve again, to, to find improved methods for solving linear by level optimization problem. And uh, 
we, we couldn't do it because we had some ideas and, and we were trying to, to, to find this big M. We say, but hey, we have a problem because those, 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 this dual polyhedron is not bounded and we don't know a bound on the, on the coordinates of the vertices. So I will stop here. You see, <laughs> I was thinking about talking about pricing, but this is time. I'm sorry. Uh, You'll have to ask me to come back and I can talk about pricing another time. <laughs> well, maybe I have uh, some uh, conclusion. Let's see if I do. I talk too much, you see. I'm sorry. Uh, no. Yeah. These are some conclusion. In fact, uh, I think this, this bi-level optimization is uh, it's a very interesting domain. Uh, full of uh, challenges and uh, very rich, very appropriate for a lot of, of problem and more and more nowadays because people are more and more interested in this field. It is uh, theoretically and computationally challenging but already at the level of the model it is challenging. You have to be really careful and you need uh, uh, what I've just explained about the big M. In fact, if you have a specific problem, if you are able to derive some bond, this happens very often for pricing problem, for instance, usually you are able to determine some big M because you know properties of your solution. And this is good, then, then it's okay. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, integration, the integration of real life feature is also a challenge. Uh, for instance, uh, when you have, uh, you want to optimize stalls in order to minimize congestion, then in the second level, um, you have, uh, what happens is that the decision of the, the people traveling influence each other. Because if it is very cheap, everybody is going on the same arc, and then the congestion increase. You see? Uh, so you have, in addition, interaction. You have several followers, and the decisions are correlated. <coughs> well, this, I think, this is what uh, I have to tell you within this time. And uh, feel free to ask questions. And uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, in this case, uh, is, is it correct in, in your opinion? Yes, this is, this is a good, uh, good point. Uh, indeed, in fact, um, when we realized that this was NPH to find those big M, uh, we talked with uh, people uh, from CPLEX and Gurobi, uh, because they, the, the alternative is to use special order set, indeed. But what they do for them in, in, their, in the software is that when they have the special order set, they look for a big M to model it. When they model the No. No. Well, it depends. But uh, we told them that they should develop something really appropriate because of this problem. Because th that was uh, the answer. You were totally right. Uh, we thought, OK. Uh, Given that if, if, if you have a problem for which you are not able to define the big M, you can always solve it like a branch and bound. I mean, you, you branch on the, the SOS, definitely. But what they do is that they okay. associate big M's. I also use it to avoid the, the big M. Because it is impossible to determine. Yeah. My God. Yes, you have to be careful with, with what because I have, I, in order to see or to to guess what they should do, yeah, 
uh, I uh, build my own tree with a small problem and then you find the solution without yes. specifying the big M because yes. you determine this is zero then yeah. I solve for the other Absolutely. one and so on. Yes. And then I build my own tree and I say they did it works. It works well and it is a, yeah. a good idea to but yes. they didn't know that they don't implement yeah. what they should do. <laughs> you can you can implement yourself the branch and bound, then yeah. you sure. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah, it's not fun. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome.